Hello friends. For this time of year I'd like to offer a video in which we'll think about the ideas of Advent, the four weeks coming up to Christmas. In this time of Advent uh, we Christians traditionally think about encountering God or becoming more aware of God or of God intervening in our world and in our lives. And I'd like to help us think about these things by reading some verses in Isaiah chapter 55. So maybe you'd like to pause the video now and open your Bible to Isaiah chapter 55. And now if we've unpaused, I'm going to read uh, Isaiah chapter 55, starting at verse 1. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labour on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear, and come to me, listen, that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I've made him a witness to the peoples, a ruler and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations you do not know will come running to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendour. Seek the Lord while he may be found, call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways, and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on them, and to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Some wonderful offers and invitations there for us. There's a popular stereotype that the New Testament is good news, that in it Christ dies for our sins and provides full and free forgiveness for us. Whereas in the Old Testament, God is severe and has complex and exacting requirements. Like all stereotypes, this is an oversimplification. There are places in the Old Testament where animal sacrifices for sin are specified in great detail. But we can now understand those as illustrations of what Christ has done for us. The other side of the coin is God's free forgiveness which is seen in the Old Testament, as here, as well as in the New Testament. But it has the same precondition. And the passage we've just read makes it clear what this is, how it works. God requires of us repentance. Let the wicked forsake their ways, and the unrighteous their thoughts. Forsake is the key word there. Repentance, I think, is when we recognise our sin as the bad thing it is. When we're enabled to see sin as God sees it, not how we usually see it. And then we recognise it and we say, I no longer want this sin to have power in my life. I don't want it to be part of me. That's not easy to do. But the good news is that when we do that, God steps in. God, as we read, will have mercy. He will freely pardon. That's what he does in response to our repentance. Okay, there is obviously a clear difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The offer of free pardon is there in both. But in the New Testament, we learn also the cost of it. The fact that God 
had to offer the terrible death of his beloved son to achieve this sacrifice, to, to provide this forgiveness for us. That's just hinted at in the Old Testament, but becomes very clear in the New. But when we learn of that, it becomes obvious uh, how God can make this unconditional offer, why nothing in our past can be too bad and exclude us from his forgiveness. Our forgiveness, although it requires repentance, doesn't depend on anything we do at all. Jesus' death for us pays for it, pays for everything, and that is a great enough sacrifice, no matter how bad we think we are or what we think we're guilty of. Well, when God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, and so on, that's, I think, a warning to us to recognise who he is. If we find that we understand all that God does, and we're entirely happy in his presence, we can be sure that the God we're thinking of is really a construction of our own mind, not the real God at all. Because God's ways and God's thoughts are above and beyond ours. We can only receive humbly what he reveals to us. We must never forget that. But I'd like to conclude by going back to the earlier verses in that chapter 55. Here it's striking that God's blessings aren't described in the way that we might have thought. We're not told of uh, being in some kind of super church or temple, or sitting on a cloud playing a harp, as the stereotype goes. His free offer sounds more like a party, and it starts now, not after death. The new life he offers us is a joyful one from now on. When I was a student in the Hall of Residence, uh, some time ago of course, some of us who were Christians had the habit of writing out Bible verses and putting them on the doors of our rooms to be seen by people passing by. On one occasion, I posted up this one. Come, all you are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. One of my friends from just down the corridor came knocking on the door and said, never mind the milk, I've come for my free wine. Luckily, I thought of telling him that I wasn't stocking it. He had to apply direct to the supplier. But this free offer is hugely generous, isn't it? God says, come, take what you need, what you want, with no question of having to make any payment. There's no price, there's no money involved. It's just a gift. We have nothing God needs. He just wants us to receive what he will give. We learn here that this is what's best for us, and God knows it because he knows us. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labour on what does not satisfy? Put like that, it sounds crazy to go our own way and work for things which won't be good for us, rather than receiving what God has for us. Instead, listen, listen to me and eat what is good. It sounds so obvious, and yet we find it incredibly difficult to tell the difference sometimes, don't we? Well, those verses have made clear for us that God loves us. He understands us, although we don't understand him. And he wants to give us what he knows we need. Our part is to repent and receive from him. So coming up to Christmas, let's remember that his greatest gift is his son coming into the world to save us. Let's focus on that rather than all the busy things of the time of year, which won't really satisfy us. If we can do that, we will indeed have a joyful Christmas. We will delight in the richest of fare. Let's conclude with a short prayer together. Heavenly Father, 
We pray that we may be more aware of being in your presence and more willing to receive the great blessings you hold out to us. Please reveal yourself to us, that we may understand your purposes for us better, that we may trust you, follow you and serve you better. Coming up to Christmas, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, who we remember was born among us, lived a perfect life without sin, died to take away our sins and gloriously rose to life again. Please work in our lives. Enable us to understand your love more fully and show that love to others too. Amen. I'd like to wish you all a Merry Christmas and as always I say, see you soon. Bye for now.